Hello, everyone, and welcome to Red Canary's final 2023 Threat Detection Series live webinar. My name is Adam, and I'll be your moderator. We have a phenomenal presentation lined up for you today, courtesy of our speaker, Keith. But before we get to that, I'd like to go over just a few housekeeping items. Today's webinar is being recorded and will be available for replay within a few hours this afternoon. The console you're looking at is the console you're looking at is 100% customizable. Feel free to adjust the sizing of the boxes on screen to your liking. Please feel free to use the attendee chat as well as submit any questions for Keith via the Q&A box shown on your screen. We've loaded some great content for you in the resources box. I highly encourage you to check those out as you have time. And lastly, if you do encounter any technical difficulties during the webinar, please clear your cache and or refresh your browser window. Keith, over to you. Howdy, everyone. Uh, good afternoon. Welcome to Validation Station. Uh, we're here today to talk about open source threat emulation, uh, taking threat reports that you receive from Red Canary or from, from others in the industry or the community and turning those uh, using open source tools and techniques um, into an emulation plan and ultimately into a set of payloads that you can use to validate your defenses. I'm Keith McCammon, one of the founders here at Red Canary and part of the founding team behind our Atomic Red team. Um, background in offensive information operations prior to Red Canary, uh, unapologetic cat person. Uh, for today's, uh, by way of an agenda, we're going to walk through a very brief introduction to Atomic Red Team just to make sure everyone's kind of calibrated and on the same page. Then we're going to talk about uh, going from a threat report or a PDF um, uh, into a, a really basic emulation plan, uh, really looking at what we extract from those to figure out what we want to test. Then we'll take a uh, next step and we'll turn those uh, using Atomic Red Team into a set of payloads that you can use to execute your test and we'll also talk about some of the really exciting uh, open source tools that have made this even easier, uh, either easier to automate, um, easier to kind of capture and store over time. And also a tool that we developed just to make you uh, to make it easier to track and measure your testing. So as promised, a very brief introduction to Atomic Red Team first. Uh, before we do that, we will set the stage uh, for those of you who might not be familiar with MITRE ATT&CK or haven't worked with it extensively. So um, we mentioned this because ATT&CK is kind of the underlying uh, framework that we use to organize Atomic Red Team. So MITRE ATT&CK is a taxonomy for documenting adversary tactics and techniques. So we say that the adversary is usually the who behind you know, a malicious action. The tactics are the things across the top are what adversaries want. So they need to gain initial access into an organization. They need to gain execution on a target device and so forth. And then you have a whole bunch of techniques and sub techniques, and that's how they get, like that's how they achieve those tactics. Uh, there, there can be hundreds and hundreds of those. And when you look at the procedures behind them, which we'll kind of go into a little bit later, um, there can be many thousands of implementations of these techniques. So we created Atomic Red Team to help really demystify uh, adversary tradecraft, to make it easier to understand and organize the things that we see adversaries doing. Uh, that has since expanded significantly. Uh, Atomic Red Team is really, a, I'd like to say, by and for the community. So it's maintained by a team of folks, um, not just here at Red Canary, and the tests, over 1,500 of them today that are in there and exceptionally well-documented uh, across a number of techniques have been contributed by folks all over the world. And so these tests are focused, they have minimal dependencies, and they are defined in a structured format, again, mapped to MITRE ATT&CK, that can be used by automation frameworks in addition to being able to, to run them just ad hoc. And again, we kind of walk through both of those examples as we get into the tests. So I mentioned there's around 1500 tests, right? So where do you start? Uh, this is a kind of common, like it's a blessing and a curse of things like Atomic Red Team, right? You can test anything you want, but that might not be a particularly useful starting point. So what should we be testing? Talk a little bit about concept of threat modeling. Uh, we love to tell people in this industry, um, you know, ask people what's in your threat model. 
tell them just go do threat modeling. Technically, this is the right answer, but most folks uh, here, and I include myself in this, can't just sit down and make a threat model for our organization from scratch. Um, it's not overly complex, but it's also not trivial. Um, and you know, there's a maybe controversial argument that it's probably not necessary right out of the gate. So to give you an example of what threat modeling is, right? Uh, when people say, just go make a threat model, the concept here really, and this is exceptionally useful, particular, particularly for in-house or bespoke applications, is really to understand the data and the process flow and all the ways that both legitimate users, but also adversaries could interact with your system, right? And then the point of this is to prioritize those things and figure out how to go fix them. So that's a neat diagram. Uh, what we wanna do is take a little bit simpler approach and figure out what threat modeling looks like for the rest of us. And in particular, how you can get to a useful threat model as quickly as possible. The point of that is answering the question, hey, of these you know thousands of tests or things that I could run that an adversary might do, which ones matter? And so I talk about threat modeling uh, for humans, uh, we try to break this down really simply and just understand that we've got a set of systems on our side. The adversary has a set of things that they want. And then in general, you know, the intersection of those two is where we've got a technology uh, on, our, on our side. There's a vulnerability, either a software vulnerability or a configuration vulnerability, an opportunity ultimately for the adversary to leverage what we have to get what we want. It's that simple. And so when we talk about threat modeling in the context of like using it as a tool to get started with something like emulation or testing, like we want it to be that simple and that clear. And so the concept that uh, that I really like to, to use to frame this is that like we absolutely, all of us here have a baseline threat model. Each of us uses some cross-section of Windows, Mac OS, Linux, AWS, Azure. Uh, and we know from experience here at Red Canary that yes, every organization is different, but most of the technology that makes up our attack surface is the same. And we know that threats are 99% uniform and predictable despite our different implementations and those edge cases that exist inside of each of our organizations. And so, uh, particularly when it comes to doing things like getting started with testing your defenses um, and just trying to understand like where and how your controls are working and where you have opportunities to improve, a good enough threat model is more than good enough for most of us. So we have a menu of approaches we can use when we can talk about this baseline threat model and just think of these as starting points, right? Uh, you can... The most granular level, and this is where you'll see, like this is how Atomic Red Team's organized. This is how most uh, commercial adversary emulation tools, like this is usually like, one of the smaller units is like techniques. And so these things are very specific. Um, they're very straightforward, right? You can take a whole bunch of techniques and snap them together into an emulation plan. Um, but the bad news again is like they're voluminous, right? And there are a ton of variations and so when you look at something like the attack matrix where you've got hundreds of techniques, you're going to have thousands and thousands and thousands of ways that you can potentially implement those techniques and that adversaries will implement those techniques. Next, we have threats. Um, and then these are a little bit more abstract, right? So a technique uh, or a threat comprises a number of techniques in a particular sequence. And so these are a little bit more abstract. Um, there could be a little bit of legwork needed to go take a threat um, like Gootloader and understand what techniques it uses and then you know which implementations of those techniques are most relevant. Um, but these are more manageable in number. <clears throat> so you're not gonna have thousands and thousands and thousands of threats that you need to worry about or understand. Um, and they do change occasionally, right? So threats most commonly, we talk about the who behind these attacks, right? The adversaries, um, of course, they're going to adapt the techniques and the implementations that they use. Um, 
in response to like our defenses, right? When we understand, like once we start to understand their trade craft and those things are getting detected, getting interdicted, prevented, they're going to adapt. Uh, last thing in the menu here are risks or trends. And <clears throat> these are the most high level. Um, these are things like ransomware, like business email compromise, right? These are very, very high level. Uh, these like these types of risks are usually going to bring to bear a number of different threats, right? Meaning a uh, number of pieces of software that the adversary uses at different stages of their intrusion or their attack. Um, there are relatively few of these compared to the rest. And these rarely change, right? So these can be, um, for better or worse, uh, these can be a really useful starting point for just understanding that, you know, something like ransomware is probably in everyone's threat model. And just to illustrate this a little bit more, uh, just breaking down these, you know, kind of this menu a little bit further. Again, these are techniques, very specific. Uh, these are from our threat detection report last year. You can see things like Windows Command Shell, PowerShell, Windows Management Instrumentation. Uh, these are really, really common. Uh, you know, one of the things that I'll also say about techniques is that despite the fact that there are hundreds of these techniques and thousands and thousands of implementations of them, uh, there's relatively little drift over the last five years of us doing structured reporting here. So despite the fact that uh, adversaries will change how they use these techniques, we do find that adversaries are using a relatively small number of techniques that continue to be effective over time. Of course, like some of the common things you'll notice with these techniques <clears throat> and the reason that they're effective is that adversaries are leveraging features of the platforms that they target, like PowerShell, Windows Command Shell. These are things that we can't just wholesale take away from them, and therefore they'll continue to figure out how to use these to be effective in attacks. Um, these are really well defined by like attack and atomic red team. And so when, you know, by way of that menu, uh, your ability to test and detect and respond to the most common adversary techniques is going to take you really, really far, right? Uh, threats, just to provide a little bit more illustrative example here, uh, you can see on the left, you have things like Qbot, uh, ad search, you've got boot loader. Uh, some of these are, are, uh, software or systems or or entire like sprawling infrastructure that have been put together by adversaries to use over time. But I'd say like, you know the other thing to take away here is that a lot of these um, things like Cobalt Strike, Bloodhound, Impacket, Mimi Cats like are tools that are available for you to understand, <clears throat> to test with, and to use. So, um, and to the point about you know like I mentioned earlier, technique drift even looking at all of these different threats and how these change month over month when we do our monthly intelligence insights reporting, uh, you're still going to have a tremendous amount of overlap in the underlying techniques that these threats leverage. So when I mentioned that being able to detect and respond to the most common adversary techniques will take you far, this is why, um, despite the fact that there are dozens or hundreds of threats that are prevalent at a given time, depending on <clears throat> kind of the aperture of uh, your intelligence operation or where you're looking, um, still a relatively small number of underlying techniques that these folks are using very, very effectively. Then the last thing we'll look at <clears throat> are the risks or trends. And I mentioned before, this is, <clears throat> this is stuff that we all get to worry about, right? Um, data loss, extortion, account compromise, ransomware, things like that, right? These are, uh, for better or for worse, like, these are things that we can assume are in everyone's threat model. And so for the purposes of this exercise, like this is a really useful place to start if you want to figure out how to perform some emulation and some testing and get to the point that you have some confidence in your controls. So now we'll dig right in. We're going to go look at some threat reports and we'll look at the features that we want to extract from those to turn those into emulation plans. So using that same model that we just walked through, those menu of options, right? Uh, starting with the high level trend, looking at the different threats that comprise that risk or trend, and then the underlying techniques. Um, 
we're going to call like these are think of these as the building blocks of your emulation plans when you're reading a threat report uh when red canary publishes a new piece of intelligence or you know your favorite vendor releases a threat report or an incident response postmortem um these are really useful things to extract right and so starting with the big picture like the the high level risk like ransomware um, that's a really great, great place to start, right? Just understanding what the adversary's objective was. And then you start to piece together the things that they've done, uh, like in those building blocks that they've taken to get there. So in this case, ransomware has a very common uh, set of precursors as we refer to them. These are things that we can expect to see and that we want to detect that don't always lead to ransomware, but very, very commonly, these are the things that ransomware operators are using at different, particularly early stages of their attack. And so these are threats. Uh, the threats can be clusters of activity, could be named threats or threat actors that you commonly hear about. They could be pieces of software. Again, the point is that these threats all, um, in this case, are precursors that are indicative of the early stages of a ransomware attack. So in this, we've got Qbot, Sock Gaulish, and Loader. And then as we're reading through these threat reports, we want to start to extract the different techniques that these threats leverage, right? Um, so in this case, you can see Qbot leveraging things like ingress tool transfer, masquerading, run DLL32, that's signed proxy execution. And so like, these are again, not exhaustive, but these are a few of the techniques. And this is an illustrative example you want to start walking through and understanding these. And you'll see, even as you look across these few really prevalent threats, there's, um, I mentioned, there's not a lot of drift in the underlying techniques that these folks use. And you can see that here, right? They're using a lot of the same techniques. Um, and in particular, like this is like, they are expertly living off the land, right? So now when we look across this, we've got these very basic building blocks of these three emulation plans. Are they perfect? Definitely not. Um, but if you follow these through, uh, take these, break them down, figure out uh, tests, procedures, things that you can execute on your devices or in your environment, like, will you still learn something if you take these basic plans and follow them through? Absolutely. So we'll do that now. We'll take, we'll take an example of one of these. We'll take one of these, like the, this kind of framework for these emulation plans, and we'll break that down into a set of payloads that we can use to execute in our environment. So we're gonna start by looking uh, at Sock Gaulish. We'll use this as our first example. So uh, Sock Gaulish leverages drive-by downloads and they effectively masquerade as software updates and they wanna trick users into visiting these compromised websites where they go download their software update, which of course results in them executing malware. And so when we read, you know, read through these threat reports, we extract kind of the features of this threat and they do a few common things. They use Windows script host, which is spawned from the browser and they make external network connections. They're gonna use Windows management instrumentation or WMIC to enumerate counts, right? Understand uh, you know, who's who in the zoo on the device they've landed on. And then they're gonna enumerate domain trust relationships using a tool called NL test. And that's gonna help them understand now that they, now that they know where they are and they understand the accounts or the local accounts they have access to, they're going to try to figure out how they can move around. So T1105 ingress tool transfer, you can see they're going to use W script. They're going to go download a VB script file. Then the next thing they're going to do is use T1033. That's the masquerading technique. And so they're going to use WMIC in this case, they're going to use that to enumerate all the user accounts on the system. And keep in mind, right, these are all still just using that same really simple framework that we laid out before. And then you'll see them use uh, NL test. They're going to look for domain trusts, trusted domains, and perform some enumeration. So these things like under the hood, uh, you'll notice that, you know, things like T1482 and like signed binary proxy execution, like they're using uh, behind these tests like, and as part of their larger framework, like they're doing other things behind the scenes. This is the point of this is to get to the, like a really simple ex, uh, uh, emulation plan based on Atomic Red Team that you can use. And so inside of Atomic Red Team, 
if you pop out there to atomicredteam.io, you can look up these technique names and then you can figure out from the menu there, which of these tests are gonna help you emulate this threat. Next, we've got Glute Loader. So we're gonna dive into this one a little bit deeper. So this is a JavaScript-based malware family or a JScript-based malware family. Uh, they leverage SEO poisoning and compromised websites. This is similar to the example we just saw. They wanna lure victims into downloading a zip archive that contains a bunch of malicious code. And the common behaviors here are gonna be that early stage execution via the JScript or the JavaScript files. Then you're gonna see later ex stage execution and defense evasion using PowerShell. And so in this case, you're gonna, we talked about living off the land earlier. This is a really good example of a threat that has like that uses PowerShell extensively from uh, just past that early stage intrusion all the way through as they continue to figure out like how to like what defenses are present on the system, how how they can work around those and continue to move laterally and get what they want. So let's again use that same framework. Start with the threat that's Gootloader. We're going to look at the techniques they leverage, and then the underlying tests. And we're going to need a little bit more screen real estate here. And I was should I should mention, please don't worry. Like the the links to this emulation plan you can see down on your screen. Um, all this will be recorded and available for you, so you don't need to worry about taking notes or screenshots. Uh, some of these are going to be far more complex than the examples that we just looked at a moment ago. And we're going to walk through them relatively quickly. The point here is just to kind of understand how to use this three-step framework to go from a threat to techniques to tests. So the first thing we're going to see is them using obfuscated files or information, T1027. T In this case, they're executing from a couldn't press JScript file. And so you can see here, these again, use WScript, go pull down that JScript file and execute that. Uh, one of the things that we found when we were making this Gootloader emulation plan, so Tess on the team, uh, as she was going through and kind of just trying to understand, uh, when we look at our detection or our analytics that we use to find this threat, um, one of the things we noticed, and these are real those subtleties, but they're important, is that the structure of that, um, of that JScript command, like the file location and the file names, the things we had in Atomic Red Team absolutely like accurately map to the technique but that specific implementation or that specific procedure the way that gootloader implements t1027 wasn't present and so in a few minutes we can just put a new test up in atomic red team that's much more representative of gootloader's implementation of this technique and now that thing's available to everyone so one of the things to take away as you do this too is that a like none of the tests are you know tests aren't always going to be perfect for your use case or for the threat that you're looking at, but if you do want to make you know even a small improvement to a test that can be really helpful to a large number of people. And so um, you know if you want to, if you're interested in contributing back to Atomic Red Team like this is maybe uh, and you're not sure why or how you would this is a perfect example right you're emulating a threat you've got a technique. The way that that technique has been implemented by that thread is a little bit different than anything we've got available. Like awesome opportunity to go make your first contribution, make that small change, document why it exists, and and ship it. So the next thing we'll see here is now that is Gootloader uh, moving on and using the command and scripting interpreters of PowerShell. Uh, so now this test tests for the exact flag and the bypass keyword, and they're going to execute. Uh, an XML download request, again, using PowerShell. And so this is one of the early stage uses of PowerShell uh, by Gootloader to go and just pull down additional information. Again, you can see here that just, this thing is, like, we've got a sample or an exemplar of this that's hosted up in Atomic Red Team that's benign. And so like not a super complex test, but now we're getting beyond, you know, just using something like WScript and executing a local file, right? So now we're um, now we're getting additional information post exploitation, right? So Gootloader is now operating on the target system, and wants to go out and pull down some additional information for command and control or otherwise. So 
So next thing we've got, um, and the last of these three is going to be using uh, scheduled tasks or jobs, right? And so in some infections, Gutloader leverages PowerShell to create these scheduled tasks for persistence. Uh, this particular test leverages PowerShell commandlets to set up a scheduled task. Um, we just launch calc at a specified time, right? So the point of this is, again, implement a benign test but still in a way that's very representative of Gutloader's, uh, you know, real world implementation of this technique, right? So um, the case, and we'll kind of show you maybe how to think about these from a testing standpoint, like how to capture that in just a moment. Um, but as you can see, like a little bit more involved test, still very, very easy to just copy, paste, and run. Um, and the underlying mechanisms this uses are gonna help you understand like whether you can observe you know, this technique and the ones that came before it, either on their own or ideally in a sequence, right? So you you can take these three things, these three simple tests, and just doing those in sequence, you should have a decent understanding of like, what you're going to see, what detection opportunities you have, um, when and if Gutloader comes calling. <clears throat> so now let's take that and let's figure out how to level that up just a little bit, right? So we kind of walked through how to start with a risk or a trend, break that down into techniques, and then take those techniques and map them back to atomic red team tests. So there's a few different ways that you can implement this or run it. Um, this is a, a cloud example for those of you that are interested in doing cloud-based tests. There's a number of those available in atomic red team. Um, but the tests that we just showed you, right? Those things I just walked you through, um, you can copy and paste those tests. It's fast and easy. Um, that is probably like the go-to mechanism for most folks that are new to a Tamak Red team, but also folks who are doing different types of detection engineering or testing, right? Um, find a technique that you care about, find a few tests that are representative of that technique. You can copy and paste them onto the target system and make them go. Um, these numbers are a little bit outdated. I think I forgot to update the slide from the last time, but you can see like we've added a hundred tests just since the last time that, uh, that I delivered this talk. So, um, really common way to get started. Super simple. Uh, that said a few really exciting things have happened just in the last few months. Um, so invoke atomic emulation is a tool that was put together. Uh, by a couple folks, uh, so Paul and, and Mike, um, so Atomic Red Team maintainers, they built this simple system just to be able to like define a like a really easy YAML format for emulation plans. And you can see here they've got a, an exemplar for Sockolish, uh, and all it does is just enumerate the different atomic tests, right? Which take the technique, starting with the technique that they leverage. And then every atomic test has a unique ID or a GUID that just makes it easy for atomic to be used in a machine readable way by other frameworks. Um, so in this invoke atomic emulation plan, this is just a script that reads from a YAML file and this is all you've got to do. You just give it the technique name, you give it that unique ID for the test. If there are input arguments, you can see down here at the bottom, um, you know, one of these tests needs uh, an input argument. You would need to give it a local computer name and you can give it anything you'd like. So like really minimal input required, that, but absolutely flexible or extensible. You can customize this to the heart's to your heart's content. Um, and like say I'm like any of my kids, like these things will clean up after themselves. And so, uh, if you look inside of an atomic red team test, we we do have like sometimes there will be prerequisites and those aren't usually prerequisites just to run the test. Oftentimes those are prerequisites that if you're using an automation framework, you would want to set up ahead of time. Um, and we also put cleanup commands in there. So we've tried to make it easy, uh, not just to execute these tests and test your defenses, but also to put your system back to a state that it was in prior to the test itself. And you can see this is what uh, these atomic, like this is what invoke atomic emulation looks like when you run it. So you can see really simple, goes and rips through atomic red team and in order from before, goes and finds that technique, finds that test. If you gave it any prerequisites or input arguments, it honors those. When it's done, it cleans up. So uh, that's from the, uh, but Paul and Mike uh, 
have a series called Atomic Center Friday. Google for that, find it. Um, highly encourage watching that. It's a ton of fun. They usually go through uh, really timely examples. Um, so use cases for Atomic Red Team, either creating new tests in response to things that are happening um, based on breaking intelligence or threats in the wild, uh, or sometimes they'll walk through things like this, right? Snapping tests together to be more representative of a threat that's prevalent. Uh, another thing that was really exciting, released early this year at SparkCon, uh, Walmart's tech conference uh, by Kerry Roberts, uh, one of the maintainers here at Atomic Red Team, uh, was the ability to chain atomics together. So very similar to what you just saw from, from Paul and Mike in Invoke Atomic Emulation. But this leverages the uh, the Invoke Atomic Red Team. That's a full-on PowerShell framework that allows you to do adversary emulation, continuous testing. So they uh, so Kerry and team took a tool that they've been using in house for some time, merged that back into the open source uh, Invoke Atomic Red Team project, and you can now do things like chain atomics. Right again, prerequisites, execution, cleanup. But the really, really cool and powerful parts of this are the continuous execution. So you can, you know, if you've got a thousand systems, you can randomize and say, hey, I want to test, you know, three of these systems every 48 hours. You can give it some information that it might need to prepare a target system, right, to prepare that thing for the test and things you might want to do afterwards to clean up. <clears throat> and it's got really robust execution logging. So like when the like, invoke atomic red team PowerShell framework is executing your adversary emulation plans. Uh, you're getting logging of process IDs, it's process exit codes. You can log that remotely via syslog. So super, super powerful tool for continuous testing and continuous improvement, uh, testing detection pipelines, logging systems. There's a whole bunch of use cases here. Um, when you see it in action, it's like, it's very, very simple. Um, works extremely well. And, you know, when you kind of think through this uh, in the context of some of those plans that we like just talked about, right, as you're going through reading, um, you know, reading a threat report and extracting these features, these techniques and these tests, um, you be, being able to take that and put it into something like Invoke Atomic Red Team, even if you're just doing this in a single system, like, just makes these tests very easy, very repeatable. You don't need to worry about any of the setup and you don't need to worry about any of the cleanup. So it becomes super practical to do a bunch of like really neat adversary emulation, um, either very repeatedly and consistently on a single target system, or if you want to get more advanced, doing that enterprise-wide. So definitely encourage checking that out. And again, all these links are available. Um, you can go to atomicredteam.io. Uh, that'll find, you know, that'll help you navigate the tests themselves and uh, also things like Invoke Atomic and other projects where you can find this runner. And maybe the thing I'll stress here is whether you're looking at this and doing really simple testing, just copying, pasting individual tests like the one I walked you through, the ones I walked you through earlier, um, that's great. If you want to do a little bit more you want to start snapping those together in a really simple way using something like invoke atomic emulation from the folks at atomic on a Friday. Like that's even better. Uh, if you do want to go, if you want to go full mad science and you want to start doing, you know, completely automated testing of a predictable plan, but in unpredictable places, you can do that. I think the one thing I want to stress is there is absolutely like there's no wrong way to do this. Um, doing any testing is better than doing no testing at all. And no matter your level of maturity, every time you run one of these tests, even just the, you know, the act of going through and reading all of the different implementations of these techniques that are available and understanding, you know, even if you feel like you have really good coverage in a particular area, starting to experiment with other variations that the community seen, right? Uh, every time I go into Atomic Red Team, I find, you know, a implementation of a technique that I might understand fairly well, but I don't understand why that test exists. And sometimes there's a great reference in there to maybe a threat report or, you know, whomever it was that created that test that articulates like why this one is maybe subtly different from one before. So there's no wrong way to do this. Um, it's a great learning exercise. 
And the last thing I'd like to walk through is just how to make a habit of this. And so this was, um, you know, the concept of really operationalizing atomic testing in the same way that we operationalize other parts of security. Uh, you know, making sure that we you know, run our test, that we review the results and repeat that. And ideally, if you can keep track of those over time, uh, getting into this habit is super helpful, right? This helps you, uh, A, on an ongoing basis, you know, you're getting your hands dirty a little bit, uh, you're not waiting for something to appear in your environment. So you like the best time to understand uh, whether you can observe or detect a threat as well before that thing comes knocking in real life, right? So, every, you know, just going through and thinking about atomic testing, big or small, as part of your ongoing security operations cadence is an extremely like, useful and valuable tool. Um, and I know like, anyone that's done this before will tell you like the things that you find, or maybe not always the things that you expect, but you learn a lot about your environment. You learn a lot about tradecraft. You learn a lot about the limitations of maybe your different logging systems and sources and how you want to change those over time. Uh, we also put together um, in the in, in the vein of like, you know, what make, gets measured gets managed. Uh, we want to try to make it simple to take this massive set of tests in the Atomic Red team, right? And this is like really a MITRE attack focused tool, but it's a really simple spreadsheet. Um, it's free, it's a Google sheet, you can clone it, do what you wish, do what you wish with it. And the concept here is that you just have, you know, the entire attack matrix as it exists, all of the techniques and the sub techniques. And for each of those, as you start to do your testing, it's a really simple tracker that lets you understand a few things. First, did you observe it? So when you execute these tests, uh, did anything at all happen, right? What log files, what event logs were created? Uh, are there any artifacts, like not just on the host, but on the network? Uh, did you see things inside of an identity system? Like was any of that activity captured, right? So just understanding if you observed the technique itself. Um, which is different than detection, but that puts you in the position where detection is possible. So then you can see if you did detect it, right? So did any of your preventative, your detective controls, like did those things raise alarms? Uh, if you have a security operations partner, um, did they notice anything when that happened? And so in general, starting with observation, making sure you can see it in the first place, then move on to detection, understand, you know, did you get a signal? Maybe the most important thing uh, to, to, and this comes with some experience, is, is understanding that like not all of these things will be detected or should be. Remember, some of these techniques are really basic, as basic as just typing who am I, right? Um, that might happen in a normal environment some number of times, maybe every day, depending on the size of the environment. So not you know, not every technique is created equal. I would say having observability into all of them um, or as many, you know, as many as you feel practical, like is maybe the most important aspect of this because it puts you in a position where you can detect it, hunt for it, take other actions. Uh, some of these will be detectable, right? So dumping credentials with Mimikatz, you would hope in any environment, uh, your controls either prevent that thing outright or they detect it. So as you start to get more experienced testing, you'll start to understand, you know, which of these tests uh, warrant detection and which ones do not. And then lastly, understanding whether the threat was mit or the test was mitigated, right? Or that technique was mitigated. So using the Mimi Cats example, it's kind of the canonical one where in an ideal environment, if Mimi Cats gets dropped on an endpoint or a device and attempts to execute, uh, Ideally, that thing gets mitigated, like it's mitigated, meaning it's prevented by your endpoint controls or otherwise, and never actually executes. That's an ideal state for that particular technique or implementation. Um, of course, again, because most of these MITRE attack techniques are benign, most of them you can't or won't mitigate. And in a lot of these cases, the best that you can do is make sure that you reliably detect them when they occur. So again, really simple tool. Um, Encourage you to take a look at it. If you have any requests, let us know if there's like changes you want to make. Again, it's a Google Sheet, so you're free to modify this to your heart's content. Uh, that concludes today's chat. Um, 
We'll open it up to questions. Uh, put some credits here on the left. This is definitely not exhaustive. We're leaving at least dozens and probably hundreds of people out here. Um, but uh, the first two uh, handles there are Paul and Mike, uh, who do some of the work with Atomics on the Friday and Invoke Atomic Emulation, <laughs> or one equals one is Carrie Roberts, uh, one of the lead maintainers of Atomic Red Team, uh, and really the, I think the workhorse behind uh, Invoke Atomic Red Team, the PowerShell execution framework, <laughs> and a lot of the automation. Um, and then there's uh, myself and Red Canary. So. Um, thank you very much. Like, really appreciate it. We'll open it up to questions now and <clears throat> we'll stick around. And uh, any of these things you want to walk through in more detail, I'm happy to, happy to lend a hand. Thank you very much.